Okay. <clears throat> I think it's time to start. This uh, session will deal with atrial fibrillation. It's going to be chaired by Bank Samuelson. Uh, Bank, of course, has a long history in, in our group here, and in, in that he's a founding member of the committee that works with the pre Galien selection, and he has been, I would say, the most productive person in, in the uh, terms of uh, coming up with ideas for, for the panels of the, uh, uh, what goes on during the day. The, the, the work of the organization is carried out at this forum where new information is reviewed and hot topics are covered. Uh, uh, Bank, of course, uh, received the Nobel Prize in 1982 for his exciting work in prostaglandins and related substances. Uh, he was president of the Karolinska uh, for a long duration, was then uh, the uh, chairman of the Nobel Foundation, and, and has uh, continued to be very active in, in science and is uh, the, the most dedicated uh, person in the committee that I chair. And so, uh, Bank, I turn this uh, uh, meeting over to you so you can introduce your panel and have your introduction. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Roy. Roy and I have known each other since, um, I think, the 60s when uh, we were both lipid biochemists and went, went to uh, different uh, conferences uh, together. The session is on atrial fibrillation, and atrial fibrillation is the most common abnormal cardiac rhythm. And it's estimated that there are about three million people in the U.S. with um, uh, atrial fibrillation and within the European Union about six million people with uh, atrial um, fibrillation. Uh, <coughs> great advances have been made both in the detection and um, treatment and uh, also in prevention of heart failure and stroke. And we have here an uh, outstanding panel. And um, I should say that um, this uh, panel has been put together by Lars Rydén. And Lars is our first uh, speaker. He is a senior professor of cardiology at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. Specializes in internal medicine and cardiology with focus on arrhythmias, cardiac pacing, heart failure and cardiovascular disease related to diabetes. Uh, Dr. Rydén has chaired numerous expert groups working to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease in Europe in collaboration with the European Society of Cardiology, European um, Commission. And next we have Dr. Jörg Kreuzer. He's a therapeutic um, head of cardiovascular disease at Böhringer Ingelheim in Germany and prior to joining the pharmaceutical industry in 2012, he was a director of the Department of Cardiology at St. Vincent's Hospital in Limburg. He received his training from the uh, University of Düsseldorf, Heidelberg, but also at UCLA uh, here in the US. In 2004, he was appointed a professor at the University of Heidelberg. And <clears throat> next we have Dr. A. John Cam, and uh, he is professor of clinical cardiology at St. George's Hospital Medical School, University of London, UK. 
and he also professor of cardiology at Imperial College in London. He's currently president-elect of the European Heart Rhythm Association. And Professor Cam is president of a major UK charity, Arrhythmia Alliance, and co-founded another highly successful medical charity, the Atrial Fibrillation Association. So Cam has been involved in the production of numerous uh, guidelines, including the uh, ESC, European Science of uh, Cytocardiology Guidelines for the Management of Atrial Fibrillation. And next we have uh, Dr. Karina Blomström Lundqvist, who is Professor of Cardiology at the University of Uppsala. She is specialized in cardiology and internal medicine and research leader for the Arrhythmia Unit, focusing on research related to atrial fibrillation. Dr. Blomström Lundqvist is the chair of the Heart Risk Group of the Swedish Society of Cardiology, chaired the working group of arrhythmias in the European Society of Cardiology and the Scientific Initiative Committee of the European Heart Rhythm Association. And last but not least, Dr. Vivek Reddy is a professor of medicine in cardiac electrophysiology at the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is also director of cardiac arrhythmia services for the Mount Sinai Hospital and the Mount Sinai Health System. Dr. Reddy is a cardiac electrophysiologist leading a team of physicians, scientists who are developing and testing advanced therapies for cardiac arrhythmias, including atrial fibrillation and ventricular tach tachycardias. So we will start with Dr. Riddell. Riddell, please. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Bengt, for this introduction, and thank you to the Galien Foundation, who has re-invited me. It is always a challenge and a great source of inspiration to be here and listen to fascinating fields of medicine. <laughs> Atrial fibrillation is one of those, actually, in need of greater attention, as we have seen here. And uh, I um, have some conflicts of interest to declare. And then we can start here. I think that all of you are not in the cardiology business, so let us look at what it is, how it is diagnosed, and some background factors. Normally, the heart beats in something called sinus rhythm. It's initiated from the sinus node, as you can see here in the right atrium, and the electrical impulses distributed over the atria are uh, passed through the atrioventricular node into the ventricles where they are transported through a special electricity leading system called bundle branches. And you have a regular beating heart, you have small P waves from the atrium and large uh, QRS complex from the ventricles. Atrial fibrillation is a very rapid electrical activity in the atria. Uh, it has been possible to identify some sources for it around the pulmonary veins, but what it causes is uh, absolutely rapid and irregular ventricular activity. Uh, as you can see here, 120 beats per minute instead of normal 75 at rest, and it also means that the uh, pooling of blood in the atria is increased, in particular in the atrial appendages where clots can formulate. So there are several problems with atrial fibrillation. 
A first diagnosed episode of atrial fibrillation may be the very first one uh, in paroxysmal, which usually lasts for less than two days. It can be persistent, and then we define it as more than seven days. It is long-standing, more than a year, and permanent, then we have accepted that it will be atrial fibrillation in the future. <coughs> To diagnose atrial fibrillation, you need an electrocardiogram. So the only way to do it is actually to, to uh, catch the atrial fibrillation with an electrocardiogram, which is not always so easy as it sounds. A persistent and long-standing and permanent atrial fibrillation can be catched. But if it is paroxysmal, then you need to do other things. You can make a ECG while ongoing, if you are lucky. You can make a long-term ECG recording with Holter monitoring equipment. You can actually have daily short-term ECG recordings by special instruments like, for instance, the uh, uh, can we um, th this uh, thumb ECG, as you can see down there, or you can nowadays even use your iPhone or your watch to diagnose atrial fibrillation. And if you look at different types of, of uh, detecting instruments, you can see that the implanted devices, which also are available, where you put a little electric uh, recorder inside the body uh, under the skin, they will record everything. And then you can see here that with downgrading accuracy, you can diagnose it with other types of instruments. But there has been a great increase in diagnostic pos possibilities through all these different recording equipments, which means that we nowadays can identify more people with atrial fibrillation than we used to, also identifying people at risk for complications. The etiological factors that we have are genetic, of course, but aging, obesity, hypertension, coronary artery disease, diabetes, and heart failure are also contributing. And what happens in, uh, in the atrial muscle wall is a hypocontractility, a stretching of the wall, inflammatory activation, ischemia sometimes, fatty infiltration. And that uh, pro uh, uh, produces a substrate for the electrical chaotic uh, uh, signals inside the atria. If you look outside the atria, in the atrial cavity, there is uh, then fibrinolysis, platelet activation, and an increased propensity to create uh, thrombotic uh, clots in the atria, in particular, as I said, in the atrial appendage. And if these are let loose, they can end up in the brain and cause stroke. Uh, but on the other hand, the other problem is also the hem hemodynamic problem because of the rapid irregular uh, ventricular activity that characterizes atrial fibrillation. What then are the clinical consequences? Well, you are to deal with rapid and irregular heart rate and loss of atrial uh, transportation. And that causes a low cardiac output. And if this very rapid rate will be standing for very many, uh, a very long time, years, you can also develop a cardiomyopathy. But immediately the patient will feel palpitations, chest pain perhaps, breathlessness, fatigue, dizziness, and arterial embolization and stroke is a very serious consequence. And a stroke developed by an arterial embolization from atrial fibrillation is usually very malignant, very uh, advanced, actually. And then you also have to take into account all the concomitant and, uh, associated conditions which uh, are deteriorating by the atrial fibrillation, but also adds to the problem with atrial fibrillation in itself. So let's look at some of the things that happens. Mortality is increased. Sudden death, heart failure, and stroke are reasons for that increased mortality. Stroke is behind, uh, atrial fibrillation is behind about one third, up to one third of all strokes, even if the uh, atrial fibrillation is just occasional, paroxysmal. So it is not the permanent atrial fibrillation that only is dangerous, it's also a short burst of it. Hospitalizations, 10 to 40% of all people with atrial fibrillation are hospitalized per annum. 
the quality of life is definitely impaired and uh, by the atrial fibrillation and by the associated cardiovascular conditions. There is a left ventricular dysfunction, heart failure. It may be one-fifth, one-third of the patients with atrial fibrillation. And the cognitive decline may also appear because it's known that people with long-standing atrial fibrillation, perhaps due to small microemboli, deteriorates over time. And we can track that by means of MR technology and other things with brain white matter uh, increased. So it's, uh, obviously it's an important type of arrhythmia. What about its epidemiological? Well, this is a WHO survey which is global. And as you can see, you are unfortunate in this part of the world. North America has uh, perhaps the highest uh, uh, adjusted, age-adjusted prevalence of atrial fibrillation. But it occurs all over the globe and it's increasing. Here you can see that the incidence in the years between 1990 and 2010, both in female and male patients, increases considerably. And if you look at the influence of age, you can also see that it's rather uncommon before the age of 35 and then increases rather steeply from middle age and upwards. So elderly people are more prone to develop atrial fibrillation. Mortality is, as you can see, increasing, both in men and women, due to atrial fibrillation. Uh, and this is a, uh, uh, the same goes for dailies, which are disability-adjusted life years, where you have mortality and, in addition, uh, even uh, suffering from uh, declined quality of life. If we then look in, in EU, there has been a prediction between the year 2000 and 2060 there will be an increase in the total number of atrial fibrillation, in particular in people above the age of 75, in men as well as in women, and less, as you can see, in those below 75. But if you sum up, in 2060 there will be about 18 million people with uh, atrial fibrillation. Of course, there is a certain uncertainty in the prediction, but between 14 and 24 million people with atrial fibrillation by then. In the United States, there also has been predictions, as you can see here. There is again an increase, and the estimated number of people is about 12 million in the year 2030, because the prediction in the United States are less uh, advanced in time than those in Europe. So let's summarize what I have said so far. It's a global epidemic increasing here. It's a substantial predicted increase in this global epidemic, due, of course, to an aging population, but also due to improved cardiovascular disease survival. If you have a disease and survive, you are more prone to develop a complication in the future. This will have a great influence on disability and mortality in the future. It will be one of the major problems in cardiovascular medicine, and it has really important impact on health economy. Imagine a stroke in a young person, let's say 45, 50 years. That is devastating, both from the personal and the societal perspective. So some aspects on the very few, but some aspects on practical management. We can define that in treatment, the desired outcome, and the benefit to the patient. And the immediate thing, if you have an acute case of atrial fibrillation, is to look for do we have to stabilize rate and rhythm uh, to, to make the patients hemodynamically stable. But in the long run, we have also to look for managing precipitating factors. If there is an increase metabolic activity, for instance, or any other underlying condition. We have to take that into account to reduce cardiovascular risk reduction. And then we have to consider the likelihood of a stroke and institute some sort of oral anticoagulation, which is highly underused in the present days. Then access to heart rate, rate control, symptomatic improvement and preservation of left ventricular function are the goals. And finally, antiarrhythmic drugs and cardioversion and other things to improve the symptoms of the patient. And all that should result in an improved life expectancy, improved quality of life, autonomy and social functioning. Today, we will focus on two things in the future presentations. Oral anticoagulation. It's 
heavily underused during the period where we only had aspirin, which isn't very efficient, and warfarin, which is difficult to treat with. New <coughs> anticoagulants have meant an enormous uh, improvement. And also on better ways to treat or ab ablate, get away with the arrhythmia, because the antiarrhythmic drugs that we used former days are not very fun for the patients to take and rather dangerous in some things. But now there are new technologies, as you will hear. And with this, I will leave the floor for the speakers who will present to you uh, present day's achievements in the management of atrial fibrillation. And I hope you know much more about this disease now. Yeah, one of the main side effects uh, of atrial fibrillation is uh, stroke. And, uh, okay. And uh, Dr. George Kreuzer will <clears throat> address this problem and talk about new oral anticoagulants, safety, efficacy, reversibility. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start, let me first thank the organizers uh, for inviting me. Let me thank uh, Professor Samuelson, Professor uh, Rütten, uh, for allowing me to be here. It's a very prestigious meeting, and uh, I'm very honored to have a chance to be here and present uh, today. Before I turn to the uh, current uh, standard of, of treatment, let me first remind us on how anticoagulation started. It was really in the 50s of the last century when warfarin was first introduced as the vitamin K antagonist to uh, be used in patients who needed anticoagulation. And that was anticoagulation for, for different reasons. It was a very difficult uh, uh, drug and uh, for good reasons, because the idea was initially to use it as rat poison. And since rats are pretty smart animals, they were not supposed to understand the underlying mechanism of why uh, they were dying. So, <laughs> so the, the, the medication had a lot of food and drug uh, interactions. It has a very narrow therapeutic window and monitoring for safety and for efficacy uh, equally was uh, mandatory. I remember when I was uh, still a fellow in the hospital, uh, all of us, we really were almost afraid of using a warfarin because we felt that we could never really get on top of this drug and that this drug was always open for additional surprises. This was really the standard for more than 50 years. So if you think about it, this was anticoagulation 1.0, and if you consider a, a, a family of, of doctors, then this had been the same treatment for the, the grandparents, the parents, and the children. They all used the same medication, and I think this is really unheard of. Uh, earlier today, we learned about iterative improvements which are happening uh, over the years. Nothing really happened uh, here for the vitamin K antagonist. And as I said, it took more than 50 years to come up with a new uh, therapeutic principle. These were the, uh, at the time, novel oral anticoagulants. Since now they're no longer novel, we tend to refer to them as non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants. These new oral anticoagulants addressed many of the limitations of uh, warfarin. There are uh, two different uh, mechanisms. Three of those uh, four novel oral anticoagulants are factor 10A antagonists, and one is a thrombin antagonist. All four of them, which are currently being used to treat patients, have been tested in large uh, clinical trials for their safety and their efficacy. It took another couple of years before uh, anticoagulation moved to a next level. And this was really the uh, advent of a reversal agent. And the development of reversal agents is not over. I will come to this in a minute. So the idea to have the option to turn 
on anticoagulation is, is appealing at the same time. Equally appealing is the idea to turn off anticoagulation, just like you would turn a switch. And this is really what a reversal agent uh, can do. It takes out the activity of the anticoagulant of the uh, blood. And with the approval of uh, Idarokizumab in 2015, Dabigatran became the first uh, oral anticoagulant with a reversal agent. Let us remind ourselves, why do we treat patients with an anticoagulant? And we just heard that we are concerned about strokes because of uh, emboli, because of a thrombus. And the uh, ugly looking red structure in the middle of this picture really is a thrombus. And I think you can easily appreciate that if this is, uh, after it's being formed uh, in the left atrium, if this is now moving to the brain and if it's occluding one of your vessels in the brain, that all the uh, brain tissue that is uh, supplied with blood uh, and oxygen uh, through this vessel will uh, subsequently uh, suffer from severe damage and you will have a stroke. The risk is fivefold increased to get a stroke if you have AFib, and around 3 million people worldwide suffer an AF related stroke each year. So, when the new neural, uh, oral anticoagulants were introduced, large trials have been carried out, and as I said, all of the four uh, which are currently being used have shown that they are uh, either equally or even more. Uh, potent than warfarin. So this is a clear uh, progress uh, in terms of efficacy. However, it's not only efficacy that is really um, making a difference here, it's also safety. And as an example, I would like to allude to the difference that the new oral anticoagulants make when it comes to bleeding into your brain, intracranial bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage even though it only occurs roughly at a level of 1% in patients who are on warfarin, it is still uh, something that has severe consequences, and um, this could be reduced by up to 70% by oral anticoagulants. And please let me remind you, even though the absolute percentage at first sight may not be very impressive, you may say, well, 1% per year is not that bad, Intracranial bleeding is not trivial. It has a very high mortality. It leads to paralysis and to severe cognitive impairment. This is actually one of the reasons why only 50% of the patients who are uh, needing a anticoagulant because of atrial fibrillation do get it. Patients, but also doctors, are afraid of bleeding. Doctors don't like to prescribe something which may have a consequence that is harmful for the patients. Patients are equally concerned about this bleeding consequence, so they like to discontinue the drug, not only because they are afraid of the bleeding, but also because they are concerned that in case they would bleed, the available therapy may not be sufficient. For many, many uh, years, the repletion of coagulation factors has been the therapy of choice when it came to bleeding either on warfarin or on a, on a NOAC. And for many patients, this uh, didn't really look as if it could be neutralized in a classical sense. So even the FDA came to the conclusion that the availability of a specific reversal agent for the NOACs would improve the confidence of clinicians and patients in these new agents and encourage an increase in appropriate stroke preventive therapy for patients with AF. Again, 50% are not using it, uh, which of course leads to the uh, um, expected high stroke rate. Idarokizumab is a um, humanized antibody fragment which has been developed to neutralize dabigatran that this is the thrombin antagonist used as an oral anticoagulant. And if uh, you add <coughs> idarokizumab to a patient's blood uh, that contains dabigatran because the patient is anticoagulated, then this will immediately bind to all uh, free dabigatran. And since the affinity is so high, it will even uh, take um, this, the dabigatran out of the bound to, to thrombin, uh, making thrombin available again for the coagulation and restoring uh, coagulation, in essence, immediately. 
It has a long-lasting effect, up to 24 hours. It has a very low immunogenicity, immunogenicity and uh, one injection uh, suffices to treat the majority of patients. It is important to make such a drug available, uh, and, and we are working on this. Currently, it's uh, available around the world in more than 8,500 centers. Let me briefly take you to the trial that has been carried out to test whether idarokizumab is uh, doing what it was supposed to do. Around 500 patients were included, patients who either had a severe bleed and presented to a hospital or patients who required emergency surgery, for instance, after a um, fall with a bicycle or uh, elsewise. Patients uh, had uh, all been on dabigatran, as you can see uh, on the left-hand side uh, of this image, and then afterwards um, the dose of idorokizumab was administered, and you can see that for up to 24 hours there's hardly any free dabigatran available in the system, indicating that the um, coagulation has been restored. The medium time to cessation of severe bleeding was around 2.5 hours, the medium time to surgery was 1.6 hours, and uh, surgeons reported that the intraoperative hemostasis was very good, with 93%. I told you that also for other NOACs, reversal agents are in development, and Dexanet Alpha um, uses a different approach. Here we are dealing with a <coughs> mutated factor uh, 10A, which is uh, IV administered to the uh, patient who is on a 10A inhibitor, and what happens is, since you are since you're administering this mutated factor 10A in excess, uh, all of the uh, 10A inhibitor will bind to this excess uh, protein and will free the um, 10A, the factor 10A, and making it available again for coagulation. It is unspecific, unspecific in the sense that all 10A inhibitors will be captured by this decoy. Um, currently, the phase three trial is ongoing. Um, it's not yet registered. It is short acting, but leads to uh, immediate uh, reversal. Ciparantac, a completely different approach, has been started to be de to develop to um, capture all anticoagulants alike, so it's supposed to be eventually the universal uh, reversal agent. It binds through uh, non-covalent bounds to um, factor uh, 10A inhibitors, but also to thrombin, to fondaparinux, to heparin, and it is um, currently being tested in phase two trials. We know from one phase one trial that clotting uh, is being uh, restored after administration of this drug, but currently, as I said, there's no phase three data available. This is data from Indexanet uh, Alpha from the trial Annexa 4, and uh, as you can see here, patients who present, and this is an example for rivaroxaban with an anticoagulant, um, they are then being treated with the respective uh, drug, which is Indexanet Alpha, um, but at the start of the um, injection of the bolus, uh, the anticoagulation is uh, uh, turned off and coagulation is being restored. <coughs> By the time the infusion ends, then the coagulation uh, goes away and anticoagulation comes back because of the still present uh, anti-10A. Interim trial data indicates that um, in 79% the hemostasis was good or excellent. So in summary, I think it's fair to say that we are in the midst of a new era of anticoagulation. NOACs now make anticoagulation possible for much more patients, which is really an unmet medical need. Remember, only 50% of the patients are currently being treated properly. NOACs are easier to manage than warfarin and reduce the bleeding risk. More strokes and then of course also the devastating consequences are being prevented and better control of anticoagulation with the availability of reversal agent is foreseen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll uh, continue on the same theme with Dr. John Cam. Stroke Thank prevention. You. Can we afford not to choose new anticoagulants rather than the classic vitamin K type. 
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samuelson. Thanks to you and Lars Redan for inviting me to this very prestigious occasion. I'm very pleased to be here, of course. I am charged this morning to talk about stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. You've heard already atrial fibrillation is an irregular heart rhythm. Stroke, you've heard of the mechanism, and the issue is how can we best prevent stroke? Now, I'd like to take you back a few years. I'd like to recall 1969. Now, this was quite a year. As you can see, man stepped on the moon. The Queen Elizabeth liner had its first main major voyage. It was the last year the Beatles had a public performance. It was the first year that Monty Python appeared. And uh, Concord broke the sound barrier. But what else happened in that year? Well, personal triumph for me. I qualified in medicine. But why do, you, do I tell you this particular story? It is because for my whole training in medicine, no one ever told me there was any risk associated with atrial fibrillation. Not once did I hear the word stroke with atrial fibrillation, and I was told that it was an acceptable alternative rhythm to the normal sinus rhythm. Now, this might be my cognitive decline. I may not have remembered it correctly, but when I looked in PubMed, I found that I was probably right because I looked at the five years prior to 1969, you can see searching for atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation, there are only two references in those five years. Not surprising, perhaps, because the seminal paper linking stroke and atrial fibrillation was published from the Framingham data in 1978. And if I look again as I did yesterday, with the same search terms in PubMed, you can see that over these last 40 years or so, there have been 6,648 publications on this matter, and of these, 795 occurred so far this year. So let's go back to the issue of warfarin. This is the major meta-analysis published by Bob Hart. Six trials, 2,900 patients altogether. You can see that there is a remarkable effect, a relative risk reduction in stroke of 64%, and what is more, a relative redu risk reduction in all-cause mortality of some 26%. And this was at a time when we had no idea how to best control anticoagulation. You can see the INR ranges were quite different. And the patients included in this trial included low and high-risk patients for stroke. Now, warfarin is undoubtedly a spectacularly effective drug. But as you've heard, it has many drawbacks. I'll show you just three to emphasize the problem. Physicians are reluctant to prescribe the drug largely because of an adverse event of bleeding in a drug which is a prophylactic medication, a very difficult sell to both patients and doctors. Only 20% of those over 85 receive an anticoagulant. When they do, in the case of warfarin, controlling the patient at the right level of anticoagulation is very difficult. And you can see that for patient reasons and for physician reasons, only about 50% of patients are in the therapeutic range. And if you're below the 50% mark, then you can see that the outcome is worse than not using a treatment at all. And even if we do use adequate anticoagulation, we can see that intracranial hemorrhage occurs even in the therapeutic range for warfarin. So there are many reasons why we have a major medical need. And let me emphasize that to you by showing just recent data provided by Duke on some healthcare providers here in the United States, the most sophisticated and the most expensive healthcare system in the world. 
16.2 million patients on the books. Of these, 230,000 have atrial fibrillation. Of those, about 85% need anticoagulation, 200,000. Of those, only 105,000 are anticoagulated. And if you count the pills that these patients collect from the pharmacy, they only take enough to cover 32% of the time. As you can see from the graph on the right, young women are badly treated compared with their male counterparts. But notice the 50% anticoagulation mark. Very few of these age and gender series exceed 50% with adequate anticoagulation. So we have these so-called NOACs, or as others would want us to call them, DOACs or TOSOACs, but cardiologists like NOACs, and we make it stand for non-vitamin K oral anticoagulants. Now, as York told you, they've all been subject to large trials. As you can see here, between 6,000 and 9,000 patients per treatment arm. The trials, however, have been quite different. The first was a, an open trial. The last three were double-blind, double-dummy trials. You can see that dosage schedules were different. Dose reduction schemes were different within the trials. The patients recruited had far different baseline characteristics for the likelihood of stroke and the proportion of patients who were for secondary prevention of stroke was very different from trial to trial. So it's very difficult to make any indirect comparisons of these trials. But we have at least some meta-analyses, and the meta-analyses do show us that for the primary efficacy, comparing these NOAC drugs with dose-adjusted warfarin, there is a significant reduction in stroke and systemic embolism. All the uh, evidence shows a reduction in this primary endpoint, but we can see that the average reduction is some 19%, and it's very statistically significant. With regard to the primary safety endpoint of major bleeding, we can see that overall there's a 14% reduction, but it's different from drug to drug and it doesn't quite make significance. But we must look also at some of the composite uh, par parts of these primary endpoints. And let's look, for example, at ischemic stroke. That's not further reduced, except in the instance of dibigotran at 150 milligrams twice daily. Hemorrhagic stroke and its safety uh, comparison intracranial hemorrhage are both significantly reduced by 50%. And mortality, too, is decreased another 10%. That's on top of the 26% that we saw with warfarin against placebo. Unfortunately, there is, of course, a price to pay. There is an increase in gastrointestinal bleeding, for that matter, most mucosal bleeding, because, of course, we have active anticoagulant in the gut and because the P-glycoprotein transporter system pumps these novel oral anticoagulants through mucous membranes. Now, those are the phase three trials on the basis of which all of these drugs were approved. But there was only one trial for each of these drugs, and the regulatory authorities therefore insisted on a great deal of real-world evidence. And I can show you only little of that, but I've chosen to show you the FDA-mandated study of dibigotran compared with warfarin. 134,000 Medicare patients, 67,000 were initiated on dibigotran and 67,000 on warfarin. You can see that for ischemic stroke, intracranial hemorrhage and mortality, there is a reduction with dibigotran compared with warfarin. There's no difference with regard to acute MI, and there is a 28% increase in major bleeding. Those results were very similar to the RELY study, the phase three study. Now, if we're talking about affordability, we have to think of the cost effectiveness of these therapies. So I'm going to look at the latest and the biggest uh, health technology assessment that's looked at all of these NOACs. It happens to be from a UK source. Now, although the 
efficacy of these therapies are probably translatable across borders and across regions. Clearly, costs are very different from place to place. So this may not apply directly to the USA, although I think it is close. This is the so-called cost-effectiveness plane, and on this plane you can see the incremental qualities on the horizontal axis. These are the quality-adjusted life years, and you can see anything to the right is clearly uh, an index of effectiveness. The further to the right, the better. The uh, cost elements are on the vertical axis, and anything that is cost-saving is clearly cost-effective in this quadrant. However, if we're prepared to pay, a willingness to pay of, say, £20,000 for each additional quali, then we can see that most of these iterations end up in a cost-effective quadrant on this graph. And so these therapies are not only effective, but they are cost-effective, at least in the United Kingdom. Now, the drugs are more expensive here, but the willingness to pay is also far higher here in the United States. And I think that we can assume that across the board, these drugs are cost-effective. To put this into a numerical uh, phrase, we can see that uh, all of these drugs have expected costs, and the costs are cheapest uh, for the NOAC drugs with the exception of rivaroxaban. All of the expected qualities are high. They are higher for the NOAC drugs than they are for warfarin. If we look at the increments, we can see incremental Costs are negative for apixaban, dabigatran, and doxaban, and a little positive for rivaroxaban. But the incremental net benefit is positive for all, especially for apixaban. So it's no surprise, I think, that guideline groups are progressively preferring to advise the prescription of the novel oral anticoagulants. Here, for example, in the EFC, a strong class one recommendation for the NOAC drugs, the pixaban, dabigatran, adoxaban, and rivaroxaban in preference to a vitamin K antagonist. And even for those already on treatment with a vitamin K antagonist, there's a recommendation to consider moving to a NOAC if the uh, time in the therapeutic range is not well controlled or if the patient prefers this move. So it's not surprising if we look at the development, the treatment pattern for anticoagulation in atrial fibrillation. For example, taking Garfield data. Some 52,000 patients recruited across 35 countries in the world. From 2010 to 2016 in five cohorts, we can see that the increase in therapy for anticoagulation has moved from some 57% to some 72% in those six years. And of those anticoagulants, clearly there has been a major increase in NOAC therapy from 4% to nearly 44% whilst vitamin K antagonist therapy has fallen. Monotherapy with antiplatelet drugs has also fallen, but there remains about 10% of very frail, very elderly patients who receive little or no in the way of antithrombotic therapy. So I think it's quite plain that uh, these drugs are becoming more and more chosen rather than the vitamin K antagonist, 60% of new starts are now with NOAC drugs. So, in conclusion, I think that, like Leonard Cohen, we have to admit that reality is one of the possibilities that we cannot afford to ignore, and thus, we cannot afford not to choose new anticoagulants rather than the classic vitamin K antagonists. Thank you very much. We'll proceed to the um, uh, next uh, talk by... Uh
Dr. Karina Blomström Lundqvist, and uh, she's talking about managing the regularly beating heart, a matter of pills or catheters. Please. So thank you very much. I would like to start and thank the organizer for inviting me to this very interesting meeting. Now, with regard to managing the irregularly beating heart, uh, the uh, aim is to reduce symptoms and improve quality of life. And as you've heard from the previous speakers, the majority of patients with atrial fibrillation are symptomatic. And almost 20% of them have severe or even disabling symptoms. And AF symptoms and a lower quality of life are associated with a higher risk of hospitalization, which for this population is around 17 to 35 percent on an annual basis. And even of these patients, 15% of these are readmitted to hospitals within 30 days. So it is really a clinical problem to treat uh, patients with atrial fibrillation. So what can pills do to the irregularly beating heart? Well, we know that antiarrhythmic drugs can prevent recurrences of atrial fibrillation, but the problems with most of these drugs is that with time there is a decline of their efficacy. And another problem is that most of these drugs are associated with an increased risk for proarrhythmia, as shown from the Cochrane analysis published in 2012. And even some of the drugs, like class 1A drugs, quinidine and disopyrubin, and sotalol, are also associated with an increase in all-cause mortality uh, when compared with controls with the exception of one drug that was recently introduced, that is dronedaron, which significantly decreased the risk of unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization or death from any cause, according to the Athena trial. So this was a drug shown with high safety and no effect on all-cause mortality. Later, large registry studies have indeed confirmed the safety of this drug. This Swedish uh, prescription registry showed that dronedarone in AF patients actually lowered mortality than other AF patients, and that was also the case for heart failure patients with atrial fibrillation. The problem is still that even dronedarone's efficacy declines with time, and this is a comparison with uh, propafenone. So from pills to catheters, how can catheter ablation uh, help? I think that catheter ablation, uh, that uh, kind of treatment, uh, goes back already to 1980 when James Cox introduced left atrial uh, isolation procedure, and he showed that by isolating the left atria, he can have the whole or the heart in sinus rhythm. A further development of the left atrial isolation procedure was the surgical maze procedure, uh, and uh, showing that by creating uh, atrial lesions that cannot harbor macroreentrant circuits, multiple wavelets or AF can be controlled because the theory was that multiple wavelet uh, was actually the cause and the origin and the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. The major breakthrough came uh, a few years later when Heisager actually proved that triggered activity uh, coming from the pulmonary veins uh, was uh, triggering atrial fibrillation. And he could beautifully demonstrate that by isolating the pulmonary veins, sinus rhythm could be maintained. And pulmonary vein isolation becomes a cornerstone for AF fibrillation once the electroanatomical system uh, was introduced. So these are, are um, over 10 randomized clinical trials comparing 
catheter ablation, with pulmonary vein isolation, with antiarrhythmic drugs. And as you can see on the x-axis, the red bars represent catheter ablation, efficacy of catheter ablation, and the blue bars uh, demonstrate the efficacy of antiarrhythmic drugs. And as you can see, catheter ablations are more eff effective in preventing AF recurrences at 12 months follow-up. <coughs> And for all these trials, I uh, have used uh, the primary endpoint AF episodes over 30 seconds and not quality of life. After these um, studies with radiofrequency ablation, cryo-balloon ablation enters the stage. And that is a one-shot tool, create and pulmonary vein isolation. And um, that technique was also recently compared with radiofrequency ablation in the fire and ice trial published uh, two years ago. And it was demonstrated that uh, cryo-balloon ablation was as effective as RF ablation. And the safety were comparable. Some studies have uh, later shown that perhaps even cryo-balloon ablation may be more, even more effective than the radiofrequency ablation techniques. <coughs> What are the long-term efficacy rates? Well, this is a trial that was recently published in this year, showing that the long-term follow-up of 10 years, you can see that there is a decline of the efficacy related to recurrences of atrial fibrillation after therapy. And uh, that the best results of catheter ablation is actually in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, as you can see the upper curve. So related to these recurrences, uh, scientists started to test other ablation techniques beyond pulmonary vein isolation. So linear lesions were introduced, non-PV trigger ablations were introduced, and without taking into consideration the mechanisms of atrial fibrillation. So in a way, it was a kind of see what happens strategy. Later randomized trials testing pulmonary vein isolation in combination with other lesions could demonstrate that there was no difference in efficacy between pulmonary vein isolation as such and combined with other uh, strategies. So most AF recurrences after PVI is actually associated with PV reconnection. So no use uh, using linear or other kinds of uh, lesion strategies. So based on these uh, knowledge and these publications, the recent uh, AF guidelines published uh, this year, it's a collaboration with the HRS and, and the European Heart Rhythm Association, uh, concluded that catheter ablation should target uh, the pulmonary vein and for all kinds of atrial fibrillation, all types, and the uh, let me get back, no. And the, the, um, uh, the uh, let's see if I can get back, no. Yeah, so the, the um, first line of treatment recommended for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation was based on these trials, antiarrhythmic drugs, uh, while catheter ablation was the first recommendation after failure of one antiarrhythmic drug. So what about AF ablation as a first-line therapy? Then there are only three randomized trials. And as you can see, all trials showed that uh, catheter ablation was superior to antiarrhythmic drugs with regard to freedom from AF, whereas two of the three trials showed that quality of life was improved. The largest trial um, with a long-term follow-up, the five years follow-up, was published this year. And this uh, mantra PUFF trial actually showed no difference in quality of life between patients undergoing catheter ablation and patients randomized to uh, antiarrhythmic drugs, which makes it questionable to recommend AF ablation as a first-line therapy. What about asymptomatic patients? Could that be a target population for AF ablation? 
Well, uh, there are two trials um, looking into this. The first trial on the left side, you can see there is no difference between those randomized to um, antiarrhythmic drugs and to AF ablation. And on the right side, you can see that the success rates were much lower uh, for patients with uh, no symptoms and randomized to catheter ablation as compared to the antiarrhythmic drug arm. So that would mean that we would have to find other benefits of ablation to this subset of patient population. Can then AF ablation, uh, catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation prevent stroke? Can it prevent heart failure or can it improve morbidity or survival? There are meta-analyses of randomized trials looking into stroke, but they showed no difference between catheter ablation and antiarrhythmic drugs. And they showed no difference with regard to mortality either. Recently, there have been, however, large uh, registry database evaluation on outcomes of AF ablation using propensity score matching. And of these six studies, all of them could demonstrate a stroke risk reduction by ablation. And three of the studies could demonstrate a reduction in mortality. So is it time to change endpoints? I think there are two recent trials worth mentioning here. It's the CAPTAF trial who used general health in the quality of life as the primary endpoint. And it was presented at the late breaking trials at the EC Barcelona Congress meeting this year. And the other trial is the CASEL AF trial, uh, which used the combined all-cause mortality and worsening of heart failure that was also presented as, at the late breaking trials at the EC in Barcelona. The CAPTAF trial was a prospective multicenter randomized clinical trial randomizing patients uh, to either pulmonary vein isolation or antiarrhythmic drugs using the general health quality of life as a primary endpoint. The unique thing about this study was that um, it used the implantable cardiac monitor to monitor the rhythm um, uh, continuously during run-in to get an idea how was the AF burden and for the three years to follow. The study demonstrated that the quality of life improved significantly more in the ablation arm compared to the drug arm. Uh, so that may be the most pr uh, relevant primary endpoint since the main indication for rhythm control is its improvement. Looking at the uh, AF burden, it showed that the AF burden was significantly reduced by both drugs and catheter ablation, but it was significantly more reduced by catheter ablation, but maybe not that to that extent as expected which supports that maybe other mechanisms than the reduction of AF burden may also explain the improved quality of life with ablation versus antiarrhythmic drugs. If we look at the causal AF trial uh, presented by Marush at the EC Congress, it includes patients with heart failure suffering from atrial fibrillation. 400 patients were randomized to either catheter ablation or conventional treatment and followed for 60 months. So this is actually the first study using a combination of mortality and hospitalization as primary endpoint. And it showed that uh, ablation was superior to conventional treatment with regard to all-cause mortality and worsening of heart failure. I haven't discussed newer technologies because there are no randomized trials using rotor ablation or using the radiofrequency one-shot tool. So my conclusions will be based on the randomized trials presented. And I think that we can conclude that catheter ablation is superior to pills in preventing AF recurrences and improving quality of life even at an early stage of the atrial fibrillation disease. It should be offered also to patients with heart failure and atrial fibrillation, and I think guidelines will have to change after the publication of, of the COSL AF trial. Larger randomized trials are needed to confirm efficacy on stroke and mortality. I think we can conclude that it is time to shift from a rhythm-based primary endpoint 
that is using AF over 30 seconds, to those clinically more important outcomes like quality of life, comorbidity and mortality. And finally, continuous monitoring heart rhythm should be used for a better development of AF ablation techniques. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we'll uh, proceed to the last presentation by Vivek Reddy. Uh, is it uh, atrial appendage or atrial fibrillation in itself that okay. mandates attention for improved prevent stroke prevention? Please. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Dr. Samuelson and Dr. Reden for the kind invitation. So this is the title of my presentation, and you should note that I do have some conflicts of interest which are listed on the bottom. These are companies that I have grant support or serve as a consultant to, and they manufacture appendage closure devices. So the question is, is it the atrial appendage or is it atrial fibrillation in itself that mandates attention for stroke prevention? Now, as you heard from the previous presentations, the incidence of atrial fibrillation is rising, and it certainly increases the risk of stroke, which is probably the most important clinical endpoint that we care about in these patients. There are certain limitations to oral anticoagulants, and this led to the interest in the role of the left atrial appendage. You see on the image on the right, the left atrial appendage is a blind pouch that's situated uh, at the, oh, let me move this here. Oh, there's no mouse, okay. That's uh, situated off the left atrium. Now, in autopsy studies and echocardiographic studies, when a thrombus <coughs> is located in people with atrial fibrillation, it's typically located in the left atrial appendage. It's seen there about 91% of the time in patients who don't have rheumatic atrial fibrillation. And this is what one can see. This is a TE image, and you see that thrombus material at the uh, apex of the left atrial appendage. And the concern is this. This is actually a very dramatic case report that was published, probably the first example in a patient who was undergoing a TE evaluation. And at the time of evaluation, you see this thrombus embolize, and the patient uh, subsequently had a stroke. So at this point, it seems straightforward. The appendage is the problem, right? Not so easy. There are other issues. So let me, I want to take you through one or two trials that, um, that uh, make us think twice about this issue. The IMPACT trial was a trial that looked at the role of remote monitoring as a way to guide anticoagulation therapy in patients who are ICD recipients or defibrillator recipients. It was a relatively large trial, almost 3,000 patients. And these patients were either randomized to a control group, meaning that they just either, they, did, they didn't receive or anticoagulation, or an intervention group, which was somewhat complicated. I don't want to go through the whole protocol. But basically, if they had a high CHAZ-VAS score, then they received anticoagulation. If their risk score was not so high, then depending on how much atrial fibrillation was seen, they would receive anticoagulation at the time that it was detected. Ultimately, there was no difference in outcome. So guiding outcome based on whether or not you detect atrial fibrillation by an internal uh, monitor did not change outcome. Why not? Well, this is interesting. So what you're looking at is a number of patients. The dotted line down the center represents when a stroke occurred in these patients. And I, I apologize, it's hard to see. But if you look at this first patient, this black represents the patient had atrial fibrillation culminating in a stroke. But look at these other patients. This patient had no detectable atrial fibrillation over the course of the previous time period, the previous months, and yet developed a stroke. And this is true in a number of patients. So there was a discordance in terms of the timing of the atrial fibrillation and the stroke event. Why is this possible? Well, there are a couple of different possibilities. One is that this is an unusual population. This doesn't represent most patients with atrial fibrillation. These are ICD re recipients. But it turns out it's not so easy. Even in pacemaker patients who don't have ventricular dysfunction, we see similar such um, phenomenon. Oh, I'm sorry. The second is that AFib and stroke are not linked mechanistically. Maybe patients who are elderly who have AFib have other mechanisms of stroke. Stroke coming from somewhere else that it's unrelated to actually the, the fibrillating atrium. And the third possibility is know that they are linked. However, the timing of atrial fibrillation isn't necessarily linked to mechanical function. We know, for example, that somebody's in atrial fibrillation and we shock the heart back into regular rhythm. There's a time bef between when you shock them into regular rhythm and when the, atri the atrial appendage starts contracting. So there is this stunning phenomenon. So what are the answers? Well, let me show you two other studies. This is a small study, but a very interesting one. 
These investigators looked at patients who had a surgical maze procedure, so they had a history of atrial fibrillation, surgical ablation, and they separated them into two groups. One group, shown in the black line, represents patients who, um, uh, who Oh, I'm sorry. So it represents patients who actually did not develop a stroke and other patients who did. What was the main difference between the groups? Well, the patients who did not develop a stroke had evidence of atrial mechanical function by echocardiogram versus patients who actually did develop a stroke had no evidence of atrial mechanical function. So what that means is even though they all underwent surgical ablation, they were all in sinus rhythm. Some patients developed stroke and some didn't, and the ones that did had evidence that the left atrium was not mechanically active, even though they were in sinus rhythm. I want to skip this slide in the interest of time. But, so based on these data, this suggests that perhaps one of the problems is that the left atrial appendage may not be mechanically contracting in certain situations if the patients are elderly and there's um, atrial scar tissue. Uh, Etc. So the question is, can we directly address this question? And there's a there was a recent um, a comparative effectiveness analysis that tried to address this question, which is if we believe that the appendage, or if we want to ask the question, is the appendage actually important in the pathogenesis of stroke? What if you remove the appendage? And this can be done surgically. So this is from the cardiac surgery database, and they looked at 10,000 plus patients who were elderly, who had an elevated risk score, and also had a history of atrial fibrillation atrial flutter at the time of undergoing their first cardiac surgery. And they had different types of cardiac surgery. The point is, in a, just over a third of the patients, they underwent surgical ligation of the appendage. So at the time of the surgery, they tied off the appendage. The remaining two-thirds of the patients did not have the, the appendage ligated. Now again, this is not a randomized study, but they did the best they could in terms of matching the patients for various clinical variables. And this is what they saw. In blue, what you see is the stroke rate, well, systemic embolism, so stroke or systemic embolism rate in patients who did not have the appendage ligated, so an open appendage. And versus in red, you see if they actually did occlude the appendage. And there was a four, approximately 40% reduction in stroke. And this, by the way, tracked with mortality. There's, there was also a decrease in mortality in patients where, this, where the appendage is ligated. So this is certainly interesting data. But again, remember, this is non-randomized data. There are other potential confounders that the physicians may not have been able to account for. So in that context, we're going to come to the percutaneous devices. So in addition to the surgical experience, we actually have randomized data with catheter procedures. So there's a device called the Watchman device. The idea was, could we mechanically close this appendage using a catheter approach? There are a number of different devices. I don't want to go through all of them right now. But the idea is you take a catheter, go through a vein in the leg, go into the heart, and through the this, um, through this sheath, you advance the device such that it springs open and includes the appendage. Now, most of the randomized data is with this particular device. You see in a CT scan on one of my patients before ligation, or, I'm sorry, before occlusion, and then after occlusion, approximately where the appendage gets truncated. So we know that technically we're able to do this. Now the question is, how well does it work? And this was the subject of the first randomized trial called Protect AF, which randomized patients who had non atrial fibrillation, who had some risks, uh, risks for a stroke, and randomized them to usual therapy at that time, which was warfarin, or to appendage closure. The primary endpoint was a composite of stroke, embolization, and cardiovascular death. And what was seen was a 40% reduction when you mechanically occlude the appendage. It was also interesting that this was driven in part by an 85% uh, reduction in hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke, we know, is a particularly bad type of stroke. And actually, that drove a 60% reduction in cardiovascular mortality and a 34% reduction in all-cause mortality. And this is mechanistically linked. It's the same mechanism, at least we believe it's the same mechanism, by which NOACs confer a mortality benefit over warfarin, because they also, as Dr. Kahn pointed out, have a significantly redu reduced incidence of hemorrhagic stroke. Now, beyond PROTECT, there was another smaller trial called PREVAIL, and what you're seeing here is a patient-level meta-analysis. Again, overall stroke rates between the appendage closure strategy versus warfarin are the same between groups. It turns out, from a mechanistic perspective, they're more ischemic strokes with the local strategy of appendage closure but it's counterbalanced by reduced hemorrhagic strokes. And again, you see the reductions in mortalities. Now, when we just talk about these uh, different types of strokes, from a patient perspective, what patients care about is, you know, how bad is the stroke? Is the stroke something that's going to be debilitating, or is it something that has, causes transient um, 
uh, mild symptoms. And so when we look at stroke severity, what you're going to see in this, in this analysis, looking at the, at the two major trials, randomized trials, is that the overall stroke rate between groups is similar. However, when we look at, when we try to separate these into those that are non-disabling strokes versus fatal or disabling strokes, what you see is with warfarin, just around half the strokes are disabling or fatal. What about with appendage closure? It turns out it's actually in favor. There are fewer they're disabling or fatal. But of course, you have more non-disabling strokes. OK, those are the randomized data. I do want to point out the total randomized data, the number of patients is just over 1,000 patients, which is not large when you compare it to the NOAC studies, which includes tens of thousands of patients. So that is an important limitation. And we try to address these by looking at non-randomized registries that have followed. So we have two FDA registries, including just over 500 patients in each. And we have a couple of post-market registries, including over 1,000 patients, one of which uses a different device. And what I want to show you, because each of these populations are slightly different in terms of level of risk, I'm going to show you the data as a function of the chads vas score. So the chads vas score is a clinical score of how, risk, how much risk the patient has in terms of developing a stroke. So on the x-axis, you see the baseline risk score. On the y-axis, you see the ischemic stroke rate. And based on population studies, what we see is that as the risk score increases, the risk of ischemic stroke increases if a patient is not treated with oral anticoagulation. And, and we know this. This is not new data. If you treat the patient with, oral, with an oral anticoagulant, like warfarin, the risk of stroke is reduced, and that you see that in red. And what you're looking, what you're seeing in these various little triangles, are the different clinical trials of appendage closure, and what the point estimate is in terms of the ischemic stroke rate with these various clinical trials. And you can see that it's all, they're all right along this line, or just slightly lower. Again, consistent data that appendage closure does reduce ischemic stroke. Of course, it is a procedure. All procedures have um, safety issues associated with it. So what are the safety issues? If we look at pericardial tamponade, there's a chance of causing a tear in the tissue as they implant the device. It's around 1% in all the clinical trials, which is comparable to what we see with other cardiovascular procedures. Procedure-related stroke, about 0.2%. Device embolization, so the device dislodging requiring percutaneous or surgical removal occurred in 1 in 400 patients. And procedure-related death does occur, but it's rare, less than 1 in 1,000. I'm going to skip a couple more slides in the interest of time. But I do want to compare this. When you think about, you know, these trials were, were compared against warfarin because that's what was available when the trials were initiated. But of course, we have the NOACs, which are clearly better medications and are primary therapy for most of our patients. But if you ask the question, where does appendage closure sit in this? Well, again, there are no direct comparisons. But when you do an indirect comparison, this is the reduction in stroke with warfarin. These are the reductions in stroke with the various NOACs that you heard about. And this is the reduction in stroke with appendage closure based on the randomized trial. So in patients that can't tolerate any of these drugs, we believe that this is a reasonable option. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to the last slide. So I think based on the data, what we see is the appendage is critical to the pathogenesis of stroke, that local therapy with appendage closure is comparable to warfarin. In terms of stroke severity, there's a 60% reduction in disabling or fatal strokes and a 50% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Safety is an issue. This is a procedure, and all procedures have risks, but it's certainly improved with operator experience and with d changes in the device design. When you compare to NOACs, there are only indirect comparisons, but, it, the, but there, does, there do seem to be favorable outcomes. So when we come back to the original question, is it the left atrial appendage or atrial fibrillation in itself that mandates attention? I think the answer is going to end up being both. I concentrated on the former, but there are probably certain populations who have non-cardioembolic stroke. And this is the area of future study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think we have uh, time for a few questions. So, yes, please. Can you use a microphone? Uh, my name is Bill Chin at Pharma. Maybe my question is to Dr. Reddy. Um, very interesting uh, information on, on closure. So my question is, um, if you had the opportunity to sort of compare left atrial appendage closure with standard of care. In other words, the addition of anticoagulants and compared to mm -hmm. anticoagulants alone, do you think that there would be uh, improvement? 
Yeah, it's a good question. It is an area that's actually being studied. There's a sur large surgical study that's going on in Canada, multi-center, using looking at surgical closure versus surgical closure plus or anticoagulation. Anyway, I think the answer to that question depends on why do people still have strokes despite the appendage being closed. There are a couple potential mechanisms. One is that it's not closed properly that you still have trauma getting past the device. We don't think that's true in most patients, but it's certainly a possibility. Second possibility, and I didn't really talk about this in the interest of time, is that the devices are not perfect. These are first generation devices. And when we put the device in, it is, in, it is immediately a more pro-thrombogenic state because it is a foreign body. So we actually put these patients on some oral anticoagulation short term. But there are still a small percent of patients that develop clot on the device. So those could embolize and cause a stroke. The third mechanism is non cardiomyopathic stroke, and that's the trickiest one. You know, we know from secondary stroke prevention studies that patients who, that, that warfarin is no better than aspirin in preventing non cardiomyopathic stroke. So the question is, after you implant the device, if you just put the patient on aspirin, did you, do you cover against both cardiomyopathic and non cardiomyopathic as best you can? On the other hand, we have recent studies like COMPASS and other studies looking at some of the NOACs in lower doses, suggesting that they may actually be helpful for reducing stroke further in these patients. So again, I think this is an area of further study. One of the most important issues is going to be cost. You know, I, didn't, I skipped my cost slide in the interest of time, but we're talking about a procedure which by definition is expensive, at least at the time of the procedure, though the cost decreases over time. But then if we add another NOAC, unless it's given for the price of aspirin, which it won't be, it's a significant cost to the health system and the patient. So that's, I think, an important issue. Thank you. Any other question? Um, OK. I think our time is up, and uh, we'll have to close. And i like to thank our panel for uh, excellent uh, contributions. Thank you very much.